standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. Hello everyone, my name is Mike Casey with Pioneer Health and Missions and it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. The title of today's presentation is One Question Can Change Everything. In this presentation, we will see how the magnitude of one question can change our lives forever, setting us on a path as servants for God and fishers of men. Our opening scripture is found in Psalm 139 verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. These are some tremendous life-changing requests, which reveal so much about the heart of David. And we're going to be examining what must take place in the heart to make such life-changing requests. But there's still another equally significant statement yet to come in this presentation. It's a question that when asked will impact the life of the asker in a most beautiful way. And again, it's not just the question, but the condition the heart must be in to come to the point of asking such a question. But before we go any further, let's ask the Lord to be with us as we proceed. So for those who can, may we please kneel. Dear Father in heaven, we ask for your presence today as we go about this presentation. Please speak through me, dear Lord, and draw each and every one of us closer to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Again, the title of today's presentation is One Question Can Change Everything. But as I mentioned, we're not going to learn of that question just yet, because first we're going to examine the request made of David in our opening scripture. And let's read the request of David once again. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So what's taking place in the heart and mind of David to make these requests? Well, it's repentance, faith, and surrender. These three factors sum up the process of David's conversion. So let's begin breaking down these factors, starting with the words, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and see if there be any wicked way in me. In these words, we see the repentant heart of David, as David is asking for his heart to be searched, as well as for him to be shown of any wicked way which he may not have yet repented of. That he may turn from those ways, and then by David's words, Lead me in the way everlasting, he shows us his willingness to surrender unto the ways of God. David also asked the Lord to try him. In this, he desires to be tested, to gain assurance that he's walking in accordance with the will of God. How many of us are willing to ask God to try us by fire to confirm that our walk is true? And when David says, and know my thoughts, he's again looking for confirmation that his thoughts are as they should be. Because what is David striving for? He's striving for the mind and character of the Father and Son to be perfectly reproduced in himself. And he's willing to do whatever the Lord may ask of him to accomplish this. What a remarkable character transformation we see in David. He provides a tremendous lesson for us all. Now, David isn't bringing about this transformation on his own. There's a driving factor behind all that's taken place in David's heart and mind, and that factor is Jesus. It's only by Jesus that the heart can ever be prepared to make the statements made of David. Let's go now to Psalm chapter 143, verse 8, and see how Jesus was working in the life of David. And it says, Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, and in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. This sincere expression of David's heart shows us his cooperation with Jesus. As he lifts his thoughts up to the Father, the fragrance of Jesus permeates his heart, leading him to make these beautiful requests. By his words, cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. He acknowledges his appreciation of where his help comes while seeking wherein he should walk, that he may do his part in that walk. In this, David shows us what a surrendered heart truly looks like. But let's break down the meaning of surrender a bit further, beginning with a dictionary. And here are some definitions. To give oneself up in favor of another, submit or yield. 
to give up completely, surrender the fort, the action of yielding, to stop fighting. So to surrender is basically to give up or to yield oneself over to another. This means that in order to surrender, we must first be willing to give up or let go, which is to repent of the life we have been living, yielding our ways over to God in exchange for His. And in order to yield and surrender our ways, we must first be willing to repent and turn from our ways. Can you see how repentance and surrenderance work so closely together? Now, we'll be looking at repentance in just a bit, but first we're going to look at the life of Jesus and His perfect example for us, showing us what it truly means to be fully surrendered to God in faith. So, let's look now to Jesus. We'll be reading from the pen of Mark in chapter 14, verses 35 and 36. And He went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from Him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. We see here that Mark's account of Jesus retreating to the garden to pray as showing Jesus falling to the ground in servitude, honor, and respect unto the Heavenly Father. Mark also describes the exchange of wills, with Jesus saying, Not what I will, but what thou wilt. Jesus lived his entire life by this rule. His faith was in God, for which he proclaims all things are possible, and not just for himself, but for all who choose to place their will on the side of God. Now John shares a similar statement from Jesus in John 5, verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which sent me. All throughout Jesus' ministry, and from the time of His youth, Jesus understood the need to surrender His will to the Father, relying on God and His will for all things. Now, Let's add even another witness to help us see just how surrendered in faith Jesus was to the Heavenly Father. For this, we go to the Spirit of Prophecy, where we'll be reading from the book, Desire of Ages. But the Son of God was surrendered to the Father's will and depended upon His power. So utterly was Christ emptied of self that He made no plans for Himself. He accepted God's plans for him, and day by day the Father unfolded his plans. So should we depend upon God that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will. Was Jesus' faith in himself and what he could do, or was his faith in the Father and what the Father could do for him? Christ was so utterly emptied of self that he made no plans for himself. He relied entirely on the Father for everything. This is the faith of Jesus and the faith which we are to have. The faith to depend fully upon the Father and in complete faith seek the Father's will over our own. So just what exactly is the Father's will for us? Well, once again, let's look to Jesus as we read a portion of the Lord's Prayer. We will be reading from Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10, where Jesus teaches us how to pray. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. It's pretty clear here what the will of the Father is, isn't it? is to live now as we will in heaven, to reveal in our lives the ways of His kingdom. This includes our diet and everything else. And this is the answer David was searching for when he says, Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. We may not know just how blessed we truly are to have been given the gift of additional light as found in the New Testament and the spirit of prophecy. Yes, David's prayer was truly answered, and it was answered for you and I that we may all have clarity on God's will for us. So, let's look at more of this light which we have been given. This time, we will be reading from 1 Corinthians 10.31 of the New Testament. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And there's even more light for us to follow in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, which says, 
Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. These scriptures which we have read from the books of Matthew, 1 Corinthians, and Proverbs together sum up God's will for us and encompasses all ten of God's commandments. And in Proverbs 3, we see trust or faith as a catalyst to surrender. And it says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Again, we can do nothing without the Lord, and in Him must be our trust if we are ever to live by the scriptures we have read. But are we willing, are we willing to live the life which God is asking us to live? Are we truly willing to have Him direct our paths? Well, there's hope, my friends. If living today as we will in heaven just isn't our desire, if acknowledging God and glorifying Him in all that we eat, say, and do just isn't pleasing to us, there's something we can do to change that. We can pray. We could pray to God to become willing to be made willing. Let's go now to the Acts of the Apostles. God wishes us to have the masteries over ourselves, but He cannot help us without our consent and cooperation. The Divine Spirit works through the powers and faculties given to man. Of ourselves, we are not able to bring the purposes and desires and inclinations into harmony with the will of God. But if we're willing to be made willing, the Savior will accomplish this for us. Yes, the Savior can accomplish this for us. Jesus could help us become willing to be made willing. And this may mean that we need to drop to our knees and pray. Pray with all our heart for this to happen. And just keep praying that prayer for just as long as it takes. And if we're persistent, soon we'll gain the desire to do the Lord's will. And in so doing, find the Lord's will to be our delight. Let's read now from Psalm 37, Verse 4, well, we'll be reading from the Revised Standard Version, which says, Take the light in the Lord, and He will give you the desire of your heart. What desire do you think the Lord will give us? It says the desire of our heart. Now, some would take this to mean that anything we desire, the Lord will give us. But that's not exactly what's being said here. What Jesus is saying is that He will grant us the desire of our heart, when our desire is to delight in His ways, not when our desire is to self and our ways. God will not grant us the desire of a heart that finds its delight in the ways of the world. It's only granted to those who seek to find delight in the ways of heaven, and in this are willing to be made willing. Now, the first part of being willing to surrender to God's desire for us is to be willing to repent and turn from the sins for which we have found to be our delight. This opens the door for Jesus to come in. Now, this is not to say that Jesus isn't already working on the heart to bring us to repentance, but it's through repentance that we truly surrender to Jesus. And this is how John the Baptist prepared the way for Jesus, by preaching repentance for the opening of hearts to Jesus. Let's read the story of John the Baptist from Matthew chapter 3, where we'll be reading verses 3, 6, 8, and 11. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. John's ministry was for the sole purpose of preparing the way for Jesus. John the Baptist knew that repentance must first take place if the heart is to be surrendered to follow Jesus. Now, there are others in the Bible who also preach this message of repentance, and Peter was one of these. He preached the same message of repentance and preparation of the second coming of Jesus, much as John did the first. We can read about this in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
Again, repentance is a process of preparation for receiving Jesus into our heart. And did you notice in what we read that it said, repent and be baptized, not be baptized, then repent. So repentance comes first. Repentance is the opening of the heart for the mind of Christ to come to us by His Spirit. It's the process of saying goodbye to the spirit of this world and saying hello and welcome to the Holy Ghost. This is one of the first and most important steps to baptism. And so few of us truly understand the relationship between repentance and baptism. Often our focus for baptism is on our new understanding of the Father and Son, and that's very good, very, very good. But my friends, there's so much more to this sacred service than just an understanding of the Father and Son. It's about repentance, faith, and surrendering our ways unto the Father and Son. Yes, baptism is about turning from sin and in faith committing to a new walk forward, willing to follow Jesus wherever He may lead. And baptism is also a public demonstration to the world and to all the universe of our commitment to the Father, His Son, and the workings of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, let's go back to the example of David, who truly understood repentance and what it means to be fully surrendered to the will of God. We will be reading from Psalm 51, verses 1 through 3. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. How did David acknowledge his transgressions? He repented, and in remorse, he turned from his sins in faith. In this, David is expressing sorrow for falling away from the ways of God. And as the Holy Spirit beckons his broken and contrite heart to repent and surrender his will over to that of the Father's, he lets go of the Spirit that had been guiding him for so long, and now is led by the Holy Spirit. Let's read Psalm 51, verse 17, which says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. We see here that God, by His Spirit, brings about sorrow and guilt for the purpose of bringing us to repentance. Now, there are some who believe that all shame and guilt is from the devil, but that's not exactly true. It was the Holy Spirit which caused David to feel shame, guilt, and sorrow for his sins, that he may repent and turn from his ways. My friends, we need to be very careful to never deny this role of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's true, though, that the devil will try to bring shame and guilt upon the forgiven after repentance, and he does this to try to make us feel as though we're not forgiven, not worthy, not acceptable in the eyes of God. He does this in hopes of breaking down our faith that we may return to our sin and despair. But once we've sincerely repented, we can put that part of our past behind us because by the merits of Jesus, we have truly been forgiven and that part of our record has been wiped clean. And now we can embark on our new walk forward in faith never to look back in shame, guilt, or sorrow. That is, of course, that we don't return to that sin. Repentance is only sincere if we're committed to not return to that sin. Now, what if we should stumble and return to that sin? What do we do? Well, that's when the Holy Spirit once again causes us to feel shame, guilt, and sorrow for our sin. And once again, we need to fall to our knees in the faith of Jesus, surrendering our hearts back unto God, asking forgiveness for our folly. And at that moment, Jesus picks us right back up again, placing us right back on the path of righteousness. And what if we don't feel sorrow or guilt for our sin or any need to repent? Well, that's when we need to make the prayer of David. Ask God to show us any wicked way that we may have. And when the Holy Spirit brings it to mind again, we drop to our knees and call on Jesus that we may turn from those ways and follow him. Now, David understood this process of repentance. In fact, he welcomed his broken and contrite heart because he knew his sorrow would soon dissipate to joy. So 
Let's learn about David's newfound peace and joy by going to Psalm chapter 142, verses 9 and 15. I will sing a new song unto thee, O God, and upon a psaltery and instrument of ten strings will I sing praises unto thee. Happy is that people that is in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. What was the new song of David? It was the song of a new heart, overflowing in songs of praise and joy unto God. David's transformation of character was truly amazing and beautiful. Well, there's still another person in the Bible who is a perfect example of the power of Jesus to change the heart, and this person is Paul. Paul had lived a life unfavorable to God, much as David in his departure from righteousness. But just as Jesus put David back on the path of righteousness, he is now lifting Paul out of a life of sin. Let's read of Paul's changed heart from Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul shows us the joy he has found in Jesus as far outweighing the life he has left behind. In fact, he even refers to the things of his former life as dung. Yes, dung, what a statement. Winning Christ meant more to him than anything this world could ever offer, and now he was fully in the service of our Lord and Savior. Paul had come from the deepest depths of sin to become a true fisher of men. Let's back up a bit now in the story of Paul and read about when Paul first surrendered his heart to the Lord in faith. This is a very significant moment in Paul's life because it reveals one question which changed his life forever. One question which set in motion a new passion to rule his heart. And that new passion was to follow Jesus wherever he may lead. Let's read now of Paul's moment of conversion. We will be reading from Acts chapter 9 verses 3-3. Through sex. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? This is the question which changed the life of Paul forever. He fell to his knees in the sorrow of a repentant heart, fully surrendered in faith unto the Lord, with absolutely no thought of the life he was leaving behind, saying, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And at that moment, his life is changed forever, never to walk in the ways of his former life ever again. Paul's converted soul will now forever be in the service of his Lord and Savior. Let's go now to the Spirit of Prophecy, where even more light is given. This time we'll be reading from the Signs of the Times. Whenever a soul falls in love with Jesus, every other affection is placed in subservience to this pure, refining principle of heavenly love. Pride, passion, and ambition, which have held sway over the natural heart, are surrendered to Jesus Christ. With Paul, the converted soul can say, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul had placed every affection he ever had in full submission to Jesus. Everything now could be summed up with one defining principle, the refining of heavenly love which is now in control of his entire being. His soul has truly fallen in love with Jesus. And when a soul truly falls in love with Jesus, their life changes. They no longer look for excuses to remain in sin. 
they gladly choose to follow Jesus wherever he may lead. And as with both David and Paul, they cooperate in every aspect of their life. They cooperate, revealing the evidence of a truly converted heart. And a truly converted heart never willingly continues in sin. And there's good news, my friends, great news. If Jesus can change the heart of David, who drifted far from the graces of God, and convert the heart of Paul, who worked against the cause of Jesus for so very long, just think what Jesus can do for you. But there's a condition, my friends. We must be willing, willing to surrender and ask the question, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And oh, the joy that will fill the soul. In closing, let's read from this day with God. Every soul who is saved must surrender his own plans and follow where Christ leads the way. The understanding must be yielded up to Christ for him to cleanse and refine and purify. This will always be done when we receive aright the teachings of Christ. Oh, how much we need a more intimate acquaintance with Him. We need to enter into His purpose and to carry out His will, saying with the whole heart, Lord, what wilt Thou have me to do? The child of God is to reach out for higher and still higher attainments. He is to confess every sin that by his example others may be helped to confess their sins and cherish the faith that works by love to purify the soul. He is to be constantly on guard, never standing still, never turning back, but ever pressing on to the mark of the high calling of God in Christ. One question. One question changed the life of Paul forever. And it's not just the question, but everything that must be present in the heart to ask such a question. And this includes Jesus, my friends. Oh, we need Jesus. So I ask, what occupies our heart? Does Jesus truly have the reins of our heart? Are we truly allowing Him to cleanse, refine, and purify our characters? And are we truly willing to ask the question, Lord, what wilt Thou have me to do? And we know the answer to this question, don't we, my friends? We know what the Father's will is for us, and Jesus is willing to help us walk in those ways if we're willing to repent and surrender in faith. And if we are, my friends, Jesus is willing to place a new heart within us. Will you let Him? If you are willing to let Jesus have your heart today, will you please join me as we come to the Lord in prayer. For those who can, may we please kneel. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus, asking for a new heart, a heart willing to ask the question, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? This is our prayer, and in Jesus' precious name we pray, Amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth Pioneer Health and Missions.